Hello class, this is chapter four, the general principles of criminal liability, mens rea, concurrence, ignorance, and mistake. The learning objectives we're going to cover in this class are as follows. To understand and appreciate that most serious crimes require criminal intent and a criminal act. To appreciate the long history of mens rea as a key element of criminal liability. To appreciate the complexity of defining and proving mens rea and to understand the difference between criminal intent and motive. To understand that criminal liability sometimes is imposed with without either objective or subjective fault, also known as strict liability. To understand the difference between general and specific intent, we will also work to understand and appreciate the differences in culpability among the model penal code or MPCs for mental states, purposely knowingly, recklessly, and negligently. Next, we will also work to understand the principle of concurrence and why it's important in criminal liability considerations. We will also work to understand that the element of causation applies only to quote unquote bad result crimes and to be able to differentiate factual cause from legal cause. To understand the ignorance of facts and law can create a reasonable doubt that the prosecution has proved the element of criminal intent. And finally, to appreciate the empirical research surrounding morality and ignorance of the law. Now let's talk about mens rea the complexity of mens rea. Mens rea is not just ancient, it's also complex. No problem of criminal law has proved more baffling through the centuries than the determination of the precise mental element necessary to convict of any crime. There are several reasons to account for this bafflement. First, whatever it means, mens rea is difficult to discover and then prove in court. Second, courts and legislatures have used so many vague and incomplete definition of the definitions of the mental element. Third, mens rea consists of several mental attitudes that range across a broad spectrum, stretching all the way from purposely committing a crime you're totally aware is criminal to merely creating risks of criminal conduct or causing criminal harms. Fourth, a different mental attitude might be to apply to each of the elements of a crime. So it's possible for one mental attitude to apply to actus reus, another to causation, another to the harm defined in the statute, and still another to attendant circumstance elements. We need to note one more complexity in mens rea, namely the relationship between mental attitude and motive. Experts disagree over the difference between motive and intent. Probably for this reason, they clarify the difference with an example. If a man murders his wife for her money, his intent was to kill, his motive was to get her money. Sometimes motive is relevant and sometimes it's not. Juries have sometimes refused to convict mercy killers of first degree murder even though the intent to kill was clearly there. The murder conviction of Robert Latimer is a good example of that. This is a case you need to look up along with many others that I've mentioned. Latimer killed his daughter to end her constant suffering and the jury refused to convict him. Motive is important in some defenses. Here's the discussion activity for you to work on. Criminal intent or mens rea is the mental state that accompanies a forbidden act. Motive is something that causes a person to act, but motive itself is not a required element of a crime. So consider these two questions. 
First, in what kind of crime is motive most likely to be important? Second, how might the motive for a crime impact sentencing by a jury? Discuss the cases that you've heard or read about in news where criminal intent and motive are important. One of the biggest challenges of mens rea is proving state of mind. You can't see a state of mind. Confessions are the only direct evidence of mental attitude. Defendants rarely confess their true intentions, so proof of their state of mind usually depends on indirect or circumstantial evidence. Acts and attendant circumstances are the overwhelming kind of circumstantial evidence. There are two kinds of fault to satisfy the mental element in criminal liability. There's subjective fault, which requires a bad mind in the actor, objective fault, which requires no purposeful or conscious bad mind in the actor, and strict liability, which is liability without either subjective or objective fault. Then you have general and specific intent. General intent is the intent to commit the criminal act forbidden by a statute, and specific intent is the general intent to commit the actus reus of a crime plus the intent to cause a criminally harmful result. The Model Penal Code has four levels of culpability, purposely, knowingly, recklessly, and negligently. Purposely means it's the most blameworthy mental state requiring the actor's conscious object to be to commit a crime or cause criminal results. Knowingly is the mental state of awareness in conducting crimes and result crimes awareness that it's practically certain that the conduct will cause a bad result. Then there's recklessly, which is the conscious creation of a substantial and unjustifiable risk of criminal harm. The MPC proposes that fact finders determine recklessness according to a two-pronged test. First, the subjective prong. Was the defendant aware of how substantial and unjustifiable the risk that they disregarded were? And the second is the objective prong. Does the defendant's disregard of risk amount to so gross a deviation from the standard that a law abiding person would observe that in a good situation? Then there's negligently. This is the mental attitude where a person acts negligently with respect to a material element of an offense when he should be aware of substantial and unjustifiable risk that the material element exists or he will be fined for his conduct. This risk must be of such a nature and degree that the actor's failure to perceive it, considering the nature and purpose of his conduct and the circumstances known to him, involved a gross deviation from the standard of care that a reasonable person would observe in the actor's situation. Here's the discussion activity for you to consider. The model penal code's four mental states are purposely, knowingly, recklessly, and negligently. First, what are each of these mental states? Next, what crimes are most likely to fall in each category? And next, should mental state impact punishment and why? Here's a new discussion activity for you to consider. What are the strict liability crimes in your state? Why do you think these behaviors have been made strict liability crimes and how are they punished? Next, are there any strict liability crimes in your state that you think should not be crimes? Why or why not? And finally, are there some behaviors that are not criminal that should be strict liability crimes? Why or why not? Concurrence means to understand the principle of concurrence and why it's important in criminal liability consideration. As far as concurrence is concerned, some mental fault has to trigger the criminal act in order to conduct crimes and the cause in resultant crimes. All crimes except strict liability offenses are subject to the concurrence requirement. It's important to know about concurrence not because it's not important but because it's never an issue.
Causation means holding an actor criminally accountable for the results of his or her conduct. Proving causation requires proving two kinds of cause, factual cause and legal cause. Factual or but-for cause means that if it weren't for an actor's conduct, the result wouldn't have occurred. Second is legal or proximate cause, a subjective question that asks, is it fair to blame the defendant for the harm triggered by a chain of events of his or her actions set into motion? Then there's intervening, intervening cause, which is an event that comes between the initial act in a sequence and the end result. Here's the discussion activity for you. First, what is causation? Next, how does factual cause different from legal cause? And finally, in what ways do these two types of causation impact a criminal case differently? Now we're going to discuss failure of proof defenses. It's also known as failure of proof defense, which also is interpreted as meaning ignorance and mistake. To understand that ignorance of facts and law can create a reasonable doubt that the prosecution has proved the element of criminal intent and also appreciate that empirical research surrounding morality and ignorance of the law also applies. Now here's the discussion activity. You can either split into groups with a study group or consider these questions on your own. What is the ignorance maximum? Why does it exist? And how does it apply differently today than it did 100 years ago? Let's talk about failure or proof defenses or continue to. Let's talk now about a general ignorance or mistake defense. A mistake of facts is a defense to criminal liability whenever the mistake prevents the formation of any fault-based mental attitude, namely purposely, knowingly, recklessly, or negligently. Failure of proof defenses are mistake defenses in which defendants usually present enough evidence to raise a reasonable doubt that the prosecution has proved the mens rea required for criminal liability. Then there's a general ignorance or mistake defense. This falls under the Model Penal Code, Section 2.04. Mistake matters when it prevents the formation of a mental attitude required by a criminal statute. And then there's morality and ignorance of the law, empirical findings, which we'll talk about in just a moment. Here are some discussion activities for you to consider. First, when is mistake a defense? Next, is it really a defense? Next, what does it mean to say that mistake is a failure of proof defense? And finally, in what kind of crimes is mistake not a defense? Why not? Now continue with failure of proof defenses. One thing to understand is that ignorance of the facts and law can create a reasonable doubt that the prosecution has proved the element of criminal intent. And next, appreciate that empirical research surrounding morality and ignorance of the law plays a role as well. In terms of ignorance of law, the presumption that defendants knew the law that they were breaking is one defense, and that would be ignorance of the law. Then there is mistake of fact. A defense to criminal liability whenever the mistake prevents the formation of any fault-based mental attitude, namely purposely, knowingly, recklessly, or negligently and failure of proof defenses are mistake defenses in which defendants usually present enough evidence to raise a reasonable doubt 
that the prosecution has proved the mens rea required for criminal liability. There is a general ignorance or mistake defense also. This falls under the Moral Penal Code, Section 2.04. Mistake matters when it prevents the formation of a mental attitude required by a criminal statute. Morality and ignorance of the law empirical findings that I mentioned before. This is also gone into very specific detail in your text. Researchers Adam L. Alter, Julia Karnokin, and John M. Darley was ruled on in 2007, and it states that conformity with community mores matter insofar as we can identify them should and can shape criminal law. There are conviction patterns. Participants believed that the moral actors were more moral than neutral actors and the immoral actors. The neutral actors were more moral than the immoral actors. As far as sentencing patterns, immoral defendants received harsher sentences than the neutral defendants and moral defendants. And again, this is all based on researchers, again, Adam L. Alter, Julia Karnokin, and John M. Darley. And that was ruled on in 2007. Please make sure that you read this carefully in your text. Here are some key cases that are featured and cover everything that we discussed in this chapter. The first is State versus Fleck in Minnesota in 2002. Ronald Gene Fleck appealed his conviction by a jury of assault by intentionally inflicting or attempting to inflict bodily harm upon another. And then you have next State versus Stark, which is Washington in 1992. The Washington State Supreme Court affirmed Calvin Clark's conviction because he purposely exposed his sexual partners to HIV. The next is State v. Johnson, which is Oregon in 1999. Pete Johnson was convicted of knowingly committing second-degree assault, and he appealed. The next case is Coppersmith v. State in Alabama in 1999. Gregory Coppersmith was charged with murder. He was convicted of reckless manslaughter and sentenced to 20 years in prison. The next case is State v. Loge, Minnesota in 2000. Stephen Loge was convicted of violating the open bottle law. The next case is State v. Bauer in Washington in 2014. Douglas L. Bauer was charged with third degree assault. And the last case for you to look at in relation to what we've covered in this chapter is State v. Jacobson in Minnesota in 2005. Richard Joseph Jacobson was charged with conspiracy to procedure, unlawful voting, and conspiracy to commit forgery. The district court certified two questions to the Court of Appeals. The Court of Appeals held that evidence of Jacobson's mistake of law is admissible because it is relevant to whether he intended to break the law. Thank you again for your time. And if you have any questions, be sure to consult your instructor. Also, make sure to read your text carefully. And remember that this is a supplement to your text, not meant to be a replacement for the text itself. Again, thank you for your time, and we'll see you next class.